So uh, hello everyone and thank you so much uh, for joining uh, ROPE's final event of 2023. My name is Ksenia Svetlova. I'm a former member of Knesset, a reporter, analyst, and this year I was very proud to become the executive director of ROPE's, the regional organization for peace, economics, and security. Some of you uh, today are joining us for the very first time. So you might be asking yourself what ROPES is and what makes it different from other peace organizations. Well, we were just, just discussing now, uh, shortly before beginning our event, uh, that uh, the idea of ROPES uh, bringing together forward thinking uh, regional leaders from Israel, Palestine, and Arab countries, uh, it was relevant before uh, the Abraham Accords, it was relevant before. Uh, everything that happened in Israel uh, and in PA during the 2023. And it was relevant before 710, and it is relevant even more today. Uh, because what we need uh, is again, you know, the new way of thinking of how we can get out our region from this mess to communicate, to uh, have this line of communications with uh, all of the countries that are seeking peace, that are seeking stability uh, and progress. Uh, and to achieve the solution for our conflict, for other conflicts that are uh, sparring out of control here in our region and jeopardizing the whole region. We are interconnected and we should be interconnected not only at war, we should be connected also in peace as well. So in ROPES, we run several types of programs that are designed to bring the uh, young leaders of the Middle East together. We hold summits for Israeli and Palestinians and regional emerging leaders uh, just this year in Belize, Georgia, uh, and also in European capitals. We bring delegations of emerging leaders from across the Middle East and North Africa to visit Israel and the West Bank uh, to the, have the, the dual narrative uh, tour. We have education exchange program uh, for Israeli, Palestinian and regional students uh, that is actually meant to uh, create a unified curricula of the Middle East. How do we teach the Middle East? How do we talk about the Middle East? Uh, and thanks to a new grant from the US Embassy in Israel, we also now have a program designed for the female journalist uh, that will be studying about the peace journalism uh, and the a, a counter attack against the fake uh, uh, news and uh, misinformation. We have uh, alumni from our programs are now coming from 10 different countries, Arab countries, and of course, uh, Palestinian authorities, Palestinian Authority and Israel. Today, we are raising money to dramatically expand all of these programs in 2024, and also to expand our Israeli-based team to include staff in the ground and in the region, specifically in the UAE and Morocco. We are currently 75% of the way to our $1 million goal. And we are very hopeful that if you share our vision of post-conflict integrated Middle East, you will be able to help us to take a step toward our goal with a tax deductible contribution of whatever level is appropriate for you. And there is a link uh, in the chat box. ROPES would not be today what it is uh, if not for the amazing support we received from our incredible advisory team. We have uh, many diplomats, uh, recent diplomats, current diplomats and ex-diplomats like Dennis Ross and Dan Shapira, uh, Israelis uh, from former military intelligence chief Amos Yadlin, former Knesset member Zava Galon, who we featured in recent weeks, but very few commanders wide respect as the person we are about to hear from today, Yossi Klein Alevi, our guest, for today's event. So a few lines about Yossi and then we'll uh, shortly uh, turn to him. Uh, he's a senior fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem, a very respectable and important institution. Together with Imam Abdullah uh, Antepli of Duke University, whom I also had the pleasure to meet a few years ago, he co-directs the Institute's Muslim Leadership Initiative, which teaches emerging uh, young uh, Muslim American leaders about Judaism, Jewish identity, and Israeli. How important is that? Halevi's 2013 book, Like Dreamers, won the Jewish Book Council's Everett Book of the Year Award. And his latest book, Letters to My Palestinian Neighbor, is a New York Times bestseller. I highly recommend to everyone who still didn't have a chance uh, to read it, to read it uh, as soon as possible. Uh, Yossi writes, of course, for many uh, uh, publications. Uh, he, uh, he was a visiting professor of Israeli studies at the Jewish Theological Seminary and served as a writer in residence at the University of Illinois. Born in Brooklyn, he moved to Israel in 1982 and he lives in Jerusalem with his wife, Sarah, who helps run a center for Jewish meditation. They have three kids. So Yossi is going to make brief opening remarks right now. Then we will take 
audience questions. So if you have a question for Yossi, please write them in the chat box. Uh, at around the 30 uh, minute mark, we will stop because uh, uh, unfortunately our guest today is very short of time. We could certainly enjoy him for more. And I'm gonna turn things over to my colleagues, Amira and Ibrahim, who will interview some of the incredible regional Arab alumni of ROPES programs. And in the end of the program, we will hear from ROPES founder and president, Birnbaum. But first, Yossi Klein Alevi, please, the mic is yours. Thanks so much, Zenia, and uh, hi, everyone. I'm honored to be here. I've been a fan of Roots from the ver very beginning. Roots has really been one of the first organizations to see the potential for a transformed Middle East. And as difficult as it is to, to imagine that right now, uh, that for me is all the more reason why I'm so glad to be with all of you because ropes, ropes really gives me hope. And I'm especially moved by the Arab participants in, uh, in the organization and even more so by the Palestinian participants because they really uh, are showing tremendous courage. And I'm very grateful to to all of you for for giving us hope and uh it's it's not an not a not an easy commodity these days the only hope for moving forward after the war is uh, is really to conceive of exactly this framework that ropes is is offering us and i know that it's very difficult to really imagine the morning after this war. Uh, both sides are traumatized in, in, in a way we really have a kind of symmetry of trauma and rage and mistrust and despair. October 7th is, is, and, and, and the aftermath has really uh, created that kind of emotional symmetry. And so tonight, I, I would like to speak to you from the Israeli side and to explain where we are emotionally right now and how we might be able to move forward. And I'll speak for myself. Where I am emotionally is in October 7th. I have not moved past those scenes Every day seems to reveal something new, some new horror. And tr I've been trying to understand what that seminal moment was in Israel's history. And we all know that something profound has changed here, that things will never be the same. We don't know how yet. And one of the things that I'm struggling to understand is what happened, what, what Hamas intended for October 7th. And we all know that atrocities, tragedies are consequences of war, of any war. But what made October 7th different was that atrocities and rape were not a consequence of war, but in this case, were the war itself. The, the purpose of October 7th was to terrorize, to demoralize, to convince Jews that they have no future between the river and the sea. And the atrocities that were inflicted were therefore, in some ways, the heart of October 7th. Now, I've supported a two-state solution for many years. I believe that, and I still believe that ultimately there's really no choice. And I'm speaking from the perspective of Israel's self-interest. I can't imagine Israel continuing in this situation for another half century. But it's inconceivable right now to imagine how that might happen. I think the 
operative conclusion of October 7th was to definitively end any possibility of a bilateral peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. Now, before October 7th, that that possibility was, was already practically nil, but after October 7th, it's become inconceivable. And yet it's precisely because the bilateral framework is dead and definitively dead that I believe that this is the moment for the ropes model, for the model of a regional solution. The morning after this war, we're all going to wake up into the same ruins of the Middle East. We're all going to wake up Palestinians, Israelis, the Gulf states, the Saudis. We're all stuck in the same Middle East. We're all stuck with each other. And my hope is that Gaza will be adopted as the first project of the Abraham Accord countries, together with the Saudis, with Israel, to begin jointly taking responsibility for rehabilitating Gaza. I believe that ultimately this is not an international project, it's a regional project. Now, the way this conflict is often perceived abroad, and certainly today, is that it's Israel versus Hamas or Israel versus the Palestinians. But the truth is, this is not a bilateral conflict alone. This has always been a regional conflict, but the terms of that regional conflict have changed. For most of Israel's existence, we were in a Sunni-Israeli conflict. And thanks to the Abraham Accords and the more formal peace agreements that we had before that with Egypt and Jordan, but which were not, uh, as we all know, genuine uh, normalization experiences, uh, the, the Abraham Accords really began changing the terms of the conflict, along with the rise of Iran and its uh, prim predominantly Shiite al allies, with, with the notable exception of Hamas. But today, what has replaced the, the Sunni-Israeli conflict is the Shiite-Israeli conflict. And the Abraham Accords emerged in part as a response to the rise of Iran and its allies. Now, given the fact that we are in the midst of, again, what I would define as a regional conflict, I believe that a regional conflict must have a regional solution. And in that context, we need to figure out not only how to broaden the, the, the relationships, but how to deepen them. And one of the mistakes, perhaps one of the fatal mistakes, that the Oslo process made was that it wasn't really an attempt to bring the two peoples together. Diplomats sat together very courageously, and tried to solve problems which, in the end, were not only determined by a line on the map, by practical solutions, but also required an, a human infrastructure, which Oslo mostly ignored. And so what gives me hope today is that we have ropes in place doing extraordinary work drawing and, and doing so in the face of despair and, and cynicism. And what I feel most grateful to all of you from Ropes is how you haven't given up. It's the easiest thing to give up. And yet here you are, day after day, trying to hold on to what you've already created and figuring out how to expand and deepen those relationships. And so we can't leave this process for the diplomats alone. That's one of the takeaways of the Oslo process. 
And I'm just deeply grateful to all of you in the audience who've, who've come today to support Roots. I can only say that I know of no better investment in Israel's future, in the future of the region, than to strengthen these young people across the Middle East who are challenging us with hope. And right now, hope is the most radical position that one can take. So thank you. Incredible words. Thank you very much, uh, Yossi. Um, it's uh, always interesting to hear a take from a philosopher, uh, because we hear a lot right now from generals specifically from generals, maybe too much from generals, <laughs> uh, much. and, uh, you know, military leaders of uh, different kinds and so on. Uh, but uh, it seems that we need to rethink in general, you know, our strategies to get to a better place. And in this regards, you see, I would like to take the prerogative uh, of a moderator, and I will ask you the first questions. And I see that there are more questions that are piling up in the chat box. I would like to ask you about hate. Because, you know, I was tackled with this question. We recently uh, went with Ben uh, uh, for a few meetings in the US and we've met uh, people who are supporters of ropes uh, in New York and Boston. And uh, some of them asked us, so how can we move on from the 710th? You know, when the trauma is so deep, when the hatred is so deep, when it's boiling in you, even if you were involved in the you know peacemaking for years and you have personal friends on both sides and so on and as you you know your personal story is incredible you know you for those who don't know you know you had this chapter with the kahanis in the in the 60s and this is the easiest choice right uh you just join those who have the that, strongest that, voice that was that that was the 1960s the 90s <laughs> long the 1960s 1960s, yes. A long 1960s. time ago. <laughs> long, long, very long time ago. But, you know, I can tell you, because I do know a little bit this, you know, extreme settlers uh, society, you know, that it's actually it's actually an easy choice, isn't it? But how do you switch from there? How do you get somebody from that place to a place of understanding, reconciliation and coexistence, Yosin? Well, it's a great question. And at this point, what I'm most concerned with is is holding on to young people who in the past didn't give in to hate and uh, and now are just emotionally overwhelmed and this is really happening on both sides uh, you know we used to say i used to say i used to focus on the palestinian authorities uh, education of incitement against against israel against jews and i think we are, we need to continue to focus on that, but we also need to focus on the hatred within within Israel, because after October seventh, that has really become, I think, a very a very serious threat. First of all, to to ourselves, to our own society, to our souls, and so I don't think we we really have time to to certainly not to unpack my my own personal journey, which which was a um a very a very long process of of healing myself from what i would regard as a self referential mindset and hatred can only function if you don't see the other all you see is yourself and your own pain and when you begin to see the other and your the most subversive quality is curiosity who is that person what do they what do those people think and when you allow curiosity to come in it undermines your ability to to wall yourself off even from quote your enemy even from the other side and curiosity is the beginning of uh, i believe of personal growth and of reconciliation so maybe maybe I, I I would say that to you, Xenia, that 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 before anything else, we need to nurture that quality of of curiosity. And curiosity is something that comes more naturally to young people than to older people. And there's something unnatural about young people shutting, walling themselves off 
from the other and denying themselves the the pleasure of the experience of encountering the other. Now that's become immeasurably more difficult for both sides after October 7th. But here is really where I hope that by expanding, by widening the lens so that it's not only Israelis and Palestinians, but it includes the region, it includes Saudis and Qataris and Moroccans and, and really across across the Middle East and 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 Near East. This for me is is the hope and I and that our partners elsewhere in the Arab world can help Israelis and Palestinians, young Israelis and Palestinians, regain something of their capacity for, for curiosity. Thank you very much for that. Inshallah, if I may say. Um, Inshallah. Martin, Martin here asks, um, as if UAE already uh, asserted that the Arab nations will not participate in the rebuilding and running of life in Gaza without, without it being in the framework uh, of uh, search uh, for a Palestinian state, then what happens when the Israeli government uh, is steadfast in opposition to the Palestinian statehood ever? Uh, he also uh, has, uh, you know, basically uh, an additional question, doesn't it require to change the government? Yes, that's, that's exactly what I wanted to say. Nothing will be able to really move in the region until this government uh, is replaced. I'm very hopeful about this government falling and certainly what you're going to see immediately after the war is the renewal of the protest movement, which I was very active in over this last year. And right now I believe it would be a mistake for tactical reasons uh, to, to try to bring the government down through through demonstrations, I think it's premature. But as soon as this, um, as soon as the war ends, God willing, uh, the the demonstrations will continue with a scale and an intensity that I believe we've never seen before in Israeli society. It is going to be overwhelming, and so the first step is elections here, and from what we're seeing in every poll that that has appeared over the last since October 7th uh the coalition that was headed by by uh Bennett and uh and Lapid and Mansour Abbas that that coalition and Benny Gantz will i believe uh be be resurrected but on a much more stable and expanded basis that's that's the hope. Yeah. And once that happens, once we have a government that is not far, that is not in in the thrall of the far right, then I believe that the region, the regional peace efforts will be back on track. And um, and I think we're going to really start seeing that the the vision of ropes will 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 once again become very uh, front and center in 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 where we're headed. Um, there was a question from Gil uh, who asks about the reactions of the Arabs in Israel, the Arab citizens of Israel. Uh, if you want to refer this, uh, you say quickly. But we also have two amazing colleagues of mine, Ibrahim and Amira, uh, who are the Arab citizens of Israel, and I think that they will be able also to uh, respond and to tell a little bit about. Uh, uh, what is happening in the uh, Israeli Arab society? Um, so I will uh, immediately put another question. Maybe no, you know, my my answer them together. Yes. Um, yes. From what we see in the polls, between seventy and eighty percent of Arab citizens of Israel, Palestinian citizens of Israel, are are unequivocally opposed to the massacre and condemn Hamas. Now that still leaves 20%. That's 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 high, but I would I would urge us to really focus on the potential that's here uh for moving beyond uh October 7th and and re-examining the relationship between between 
Arabs and Jews in this in this country. I think that that well from from the conversations that I've had with with Arab Israeli colleagues, with people here at the Hartman Institute and, and elsewhere, I I feel that everyone has gone through such a profound shock. And that really creates the ground for some new thinking. And that's 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 true for the relationship internally between Arab and Jewish citizens in Israel. And I believe it's true for our relationship with the region. And in terms of our relationship with the Palestinians, I think we're going to need a lot of help from the Arabs in the region and Arabs who are citizens of Israel. So I see I see the these two, you know, I I I really think of of Israel's relationship with the Arab world in terms of three concentric circles. The innermost circle are the Arabs who are citizens of Israel. The circle around are the Palestinians and the widest circle uh, is the Arab world. And we're going to really need a great deal of help from Arab Israelis and the Arab world to help bring us to a point where Palestinians and Israelis could even conceive of some kind of a transformed relationship. So basically you say, let's focus on the 80%, not on the 20. Um, it's good yeah. advice always. Uh, you said there are many, many questions to you, but I know that you have to leave us in exactly three and we, a half minutes. We can go an extra five minutes. Yeah, that's a Amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much, because there are so many things that people want to ask you. One is specifically about the uh, regional uh, voices. Uh, this is a question from Lisa, who asks, how does one ensure that local voices, young Israelis, young Palestinians, would be empowered to create the day after and the future coexistence? What are the critical, uh, what are the practical steps? And where does the region fits in uh, in that? So look, I can only speak about Israeli society, because that's really what I know. I think that this moment is, is already beginning to give birth to the next generation of political leaders. It's going to come from the protest movement. It's going to come from, from reservists coming back from the front. There is going to be, especially among the younger generation, a desperate hunger for some some new direction. And that's going to come from all kinds of places. And I think that that when you look at the NGOs that are thriving in Israel, they are the, these are the these are the 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 hot houses for for the emerging new generation of leaders. And really what uh what what I've seen with ropes is that it's creating a new generation of regional leaders, which is so extraordinary. And, and regional leaders who are comfortable with each other, who are, who are maturing together in, in the most excruciating times and challenges. And so the more that we see these kinds of, of efforts uh, being nurtured, uh, Really, what we're doing is investing in exactly what your question is asking about. And that's the future, the future leadership. Uh, Bob Schloss asks a very important question about uh, risk taking. Uh, peacemaking involves strategic risk taking, while the leaders in Israel, Palestine, uh, Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt, and more uh, were risk risk averse uh, for many years, and the situation was basically stalled. So the question is, uh, what actions can Rope and others take over the next seven, 12 years, which expands the uh, couple of thousand of risk-tolerant peacemakers to perhaps one million of uh, risk-tolerant uh, peacemakers? That's a great question. Yeah. Look, we, um, I think what we saw with the Abraham Accords was this breakthrough in risk-taking. And what we're seeing with the Saudis is this hesitation between risk taking and caution. It's very moving to see this process. And from what I understand, and and I think that the people in ropes would have better insight than I do, but from 
speaking to people who do know the Saudis. My sense is the Saudis are still very much uh, in the process, even if they're more cautious. And we need to develop the infrastructure of risk-taking that we already have. The tragedy of the Oslo process is that it was really a failure of risk-taking. And and the, Abra the, the Abraham Accords were the antithesis in that sense of the Oslo process. It was a breakthrough in risk-taking. Now, knowing something of the psyche of the Israeli public today, and I have to tell you, I, I'm very much a part of that. I, I, at this moment, where I am, I'm frozen. That's how I feel. I'm frozen. And what I'm going to need, and I'm speaking very personally now, but I think I'm speaking for for a large part of, of the public, including people who are devoted to peace. You know, just as an aside, um, one of my friends was, was murdered on October 7th, Vivian Silver. Some of you may know the name. She was one of the founders of Women Wage Peace. She was an extraordinary, extraordinary woman. Not at all sentimental, very hard-headed about peace, um, very pragmatic. And so the the camp in Israel that 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 has committed to to peace has been profoundly wounded. And I'm sure the Palestinians and maybe young people in the Arab world as well could would would say something similar from your side. And so in order to to unfreeze, in order to unfreeze us, what I need is to see some indication that the region is still moving toward 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 reconciliation. I don't expect initially, I don't expect the Palestinian public or the Israeli public to be in an emotional position where either is going to be able to offer gestures. That's not going to happen anytime soon. But here's really where I'm hoping the region can help us out. There is another great, great question, uh, which is very interconnected to Vivian Silver, Zichron Ali Bracha, whom I also uh, had the privilege uh, to know uh, within the lobby that I created in the Knesset for people uh, for uh, peace and security. Uh, and uh, so Edna asks, many of peaceniks who led their life in understanding the others were slaughtered in the kibbutzim and the Negev regardless uh, of their ideology and deeds. So what about the state of mind of the religious extremist people of Hamas? How can we change the hate fanatic education and brave waves of the future generation? It's a very tough question. I think you will need an hour at least. To... <laughs> well, we have a phrase in Hebrew, gadol alai. It's mm -hmm. That's bigger than I can handle. And uh, I'm, I'm at this point, I'm trying to deal uh, with my own people, with my own extremists. And Hamas really is, uh, I, I just can't imagine at this point how, how, to, how to, to begin to lessen the hatred from, from that side. And um, what one thing that I believe very deeply, and I'm going to just, and, and then forgive me, I really must, must go, but I'm going to just say something as a religious person, as a person of faith, and that is that the acts, the acts of a few people, if they're pure and well-intentioned, if they're if they're if they're committed from a place of an open heart, can change the reality on the ground in ways that we'll never know. And again, I'm speaking as someone who believes that that there is a God in the world and God works in this world through people of goodwill. And God is able to magnify the acts, the small acts, seemingly small acts of people that are committed uh, in, from, that are that that are coming from this place of of purity, and that's what gives me hope for for ropes for for other seemingly small initiatives, but that are spiritually great statements. 
and uh, and I've seen time and again how seemingly peripheral groups are able to really have an impact far beyond their the seemingly rash and um can you hear me my my yes. mic is honest and so i i really just want to say um as a as a person of faith i just want to thank ropes for for strengthening my faith for giving me the the, the renewed capacity to uh to have faith and thank you all for for participating and for supporting and um very grateful to to all of you thank you very much dear yose thank you for your time thank you for joining us today uh and we will need to have you soon uh, another time that, because there are many great questions that were posed here we will continue on uh Herikbet. okay we will uh, uh continue these conversations Take yes care, thank everybody. you so much Yes, thank you so much, Yossi.